When it comes to the science of cosmology, one of the crowning achievements of the past 100 years is the development of a standard model of cosmology. The dominant factor in determining how the universe evolves is gravitation, which is governed by general relativity and accounts for the expanding universe as well as the assembly of large-scale cosmic structures. Join us on this cosmic journey. The James Webb Telescope has just proved the Big Bang Theory is wrong. What this means The contents of the universe have been determined to be dark energy, dark matter, normal matter, neutrinos, and photons. The universe as we know it began some 13.8 billion years ago with an event known as the Hot Big Bang, with density imperfections seeded by a preceding phase known as cosmic inflation. Despite all the observational evidence we have supporting this picture, it may not be fully correct. Each time we observe the universe in a new way, we have to check that what we're seeing is still consistent with this model. With the addition of James Webb to the arsenal of tools astronomers have, is this picture in trouble? The answer would seem to be yes. So, is it time to dethrone the Big Bang Theory? Well, this topic remains controversial among scientists, as some think we need to rewrite all the textbooks, while others think that our current model just needs some updates. So who's right? All this and more will be discussed in today's episode. The first thing we have to do is lay out how we expect events to unfold in our universe based on our current picture of the universe. This picture sometimes called the standard model of cosmology sometimes, called the inflationary hot big bang, and sometimes called lambda cold dark matter, or LCDM model, has been remarkably successful in explaining features ranging from the internal motions of individual galaxies, the motions of galaxies relative to one another the motions of galaxies within groups and clusters of galaxies, we and strong gravitational lensing on all cosmic scales the structure and growth of the cosmic web and the features found in the Big Bang's leftover glow, the cosmic microwave background. It also predicts that as we look farther and farther back in time, that is to greater and greater cosmic distances, the galaxies we see will be inherently smaller, bluer, less evolved, less rich in heavy elements, and that at some point beyond where we've been able to look, we should cease to see stars or galaxies of any type as we'll reach the universe's dark ages. But that's simply a picture of what happens. What we need if we want to compare theory to observations is to quantitatively figure out not just what happens, but when it happens and quantitatively how much it happens by. Even though the laws of physics are well known and the starting point, or our initial conditions are also well known, our best quantitative predictions still come along with a large amount of uncertainty. From the theory of cosmic inflation and the patterns of fluctuations that we see in the cosmic microwave background, we know that our universe began at the start of the hot Big Bang from an almost perfectly uniform state. There were the seeds of structure, density imperfections imprinted atop that near-uniform background, leading to under-densities and over-densities, at about the one part in 30,000 level that were almost but not quite the same on all cosmic scales, about 3% larger on the size of the universe scales than on the size of a galaxy scales. We know that early on, these imperfections grew gravitationally, but also had to contend with interactions with and pressure from radiation, like photons creating a pattern of peaks and valleys in how over-dense and under-dense various regions were on a variety of cosmic scales. Then the universe forms neutral atoms about 380,000 years after the hot Big Bang and expands, cools and gravitates, according to the laws of general relativity. As long as these density imperfections remain small compared to the average density of the universe, it's easy and straightforward to compute how they grow. But as they grow larger, a series of effects all come into play, making the question of how big do they grow, and how quickly very assumption dependent. For example, as large amounts of gas begin to accrue in these overdense regions, how efficiently does that gas cool? 
As these overdense regions grow within the expanding universe, with some small scale regions superimposed atop larger scale overdensities, how do these high density regions interact in these overlapping locations? Some overdense regions will occur close to other overdense regions. How is the growth of structure affected when these regions interact? As normal matter accumulates in the centers of these overdense regions, it slows down, collides, and heats up. As that heat gets radiated away, how does that feedback affect the growth rate of these regions, including both the normal matter and the dark matter? Finally, when stars finally form in these very different environments to the ones we find today, how long do they live? How do they die? How does that impact the normal and dark matter that doesn't become stars? And what implications does that have for subsequent generations of stars and the growth of these early cosmic structures? It's important to understand that the answers to all of these questions are uncertain. They're firmly in the realm of the purely theoretical and are dependent on what details we include and exclude in our models and simulations. Are we using the correct models to identify halos, where a halo represents an individual overdensity in space, or are we incorrectly treating interdependent halos as independent entities or vice versa? Are we modeling the first stars correctly, including their initial mass functions and their death throes, or are they heavier and more likely to directly collapse to black holes than we think? For that matter, do we even need stars to form black holes, or can these intersecting inflowing streams of gas form the seeds of supermassive black holes directly, possibly with masses that are 10,000 plus times the mass of our sun right away? It's pretty clear that the very first objects, stars, black holes, and star clusters, begin forming no later than about 150 million years after the Big Bang, and perhaps as early as only 50 to 100 million years after the Big Bang. But these ought to be relatively rare occurrences, right? Evolved galaxies we should see at slightly later times, like 200, 300, or 400 million years after the Big Bang, is a much murkier question. But we don't simply have our theoretical expectations, even with the appropriate uncertainties to work off of. For the first time, owing to the unprecedented capabilities of the James Webb Space Telescope, we're beginning to discover and characterize galaxies found in these very, very early stages of our cosmic history. Scientists expected this observation to find some small blue baby galaxies at early times, objects which have just recently formed out of the primordial cosmic soup and are themselves building their early stars and structures. However, contrary to all expectations, right from the very first images sent back by the James Webb Telescope, we are already confronted with galactic behemoths, giants that simply could not have formed in the time allotted to them in the established theory of the Big Bang. According to preliminary analysis, these galaxies form just 300 million years after the Big Bang. By comparison, our planet is 4.5 billion years old, and it takes 200 million years for our galaxy, the Milky Way, to complete just one rotation. The classical theory of galaxy development cannot explain how these galaxies might have formed in such a short time, and this is just the beginning. Astronomers have always thought that galaxies couldn't have gotten very big so early in the universe's history, and would start bulking up on stars about 500 million years out from the Big Bang. But Webb's galaxies are extremely luminous, suggesting that they hold an abundance of stars which together are one billion times as massive as our Sun. In other words, the most massive galaxies in our sample are estimated to have masses two to four times lower than that of our own Milky Way. This was astounding. We're finding galaxy candidates as massive as our own galaxy when the universe was 3% of its current age. What's notable is that it isn't just the size of these galaxies that poses a problem to the established theory. So too does their composition, the stuff they are made of. Typically, such young galaxies are dust poor. However, we already find around 20% of the galaxies that assembled during this early epoch are already very dusty, 
and a significant fraction of the ultraviolet light from newborn stars is already hidden by this dust. That, put simply, broke the Big Bang model of cosmology. But the question of galaxy formation, enormous agglomerations of swirling gas, dust and stars, is only the tip of the iceberg. Observational astronomy has uncovered far, far larger structures that completely confound Big Bang cosmologists. According to the assumptions that form part of Big Bang cosmology, no cosmic object can be more than 250 million light years wide. And yet, every year, astronomers are discovering larger and larger megastructures that are billions of light years wide. For instance, early this year, scientists spotted a second ultra large structure dubbed the Big Ring that challenged held assumptions about the universe's structure. Situated 9.2 billion light years away from Earth, the Big Ring is also creating problems for the current understanding of the basic principles of cosmology. The colossal structure boasts a diameter of about 1.3 billion light years and a circumference of nearly 4 billion light years. To put its enormity into perspective, if visible, the Big Ring would span an area of the sky equivalent to 15 full moons. And of course, this is not our first discovery of a massive cosmic mystery. Two years prior, we discovered the giant arc, another megastructure measuring 3.3 billion light years across. Both the Big Ring and the giant arc reside in the same cosmic neighborhood, observed at an identical distance and era in the universe's timeline, merely 12 adeg apart in the sky. But neither of these two ultra large structures is easy to explain. Within the framework of the Big Bang theory, the Big Bang theory not only aims to explain the present state of the universe, but also its past and future evolution. Since its inception, it has undergone multiple refinements. As Edwin Hubble first observed, distant galaxies are receding from us, leading to the notion of the universe expanding from an initial point. Subsequently, the detection of the cosmic microwave background radiation, CMB, by Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson lent robust support to the theory. The theory is founded upon a singular assumption, that matter is distributed evenly in the universe, without any preferred direction. Termed the cosmological principle, this hypothesis suggests that the largest structure cannot exceed 250 million light years. As the Big Bang theory continually adjusted to accommodate new observations, the cosmological principle has been stretched to its limits. Recently, scientists from the University of Central Lancashire uncovered an unprecedented massive structure that has triggered concerns within the Big Bang cosmology. The Hercules Corona Borealis Great Wall, extending up to 10 billion light years away and spanning 10 billion light years, was discovered while analyzing data from gamma-ray bursts, GRBs. This immense cluster of galaxies, existing as far back as 10 billion years in the universe's history, poses a significant challenge. If such structures existed shortly after the Big Bang, how did they evolve into their present state? This isn't an isolated issue. We've already noted the problem of older, more evolved galaxies. Such astronomical structures defy the limitations of existing physics and mathematics, defying explanation through conventional methods. With the arrival of new observations that push our understanding to the brink, scientists face an intriguing dilemma. The entire field is contemplating the necessity of a paradigm shift, replacing the Big Bang theory altogether. This idea of a paradigm shift in the early universe was always the biggest unknown. It remains the final frontier where the answers are least known. Yet these observations pose a challenge to our current understanding. Is the Big Bang theory broken? Perhaps not definitively. Still, it must adapt and evolve in response to this influx of new information, suggesting a more nuanced perspective on our universe's origins and evolution. Thanks for joining us on this cosmic journey. Tell us your opinions in the comments section below. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the video on your screen for more mind-bending content. Until next time, 
keep gazing at the stars. This is Cosmic Inquiries signing off.